but just believe in God that he would continue to heal. Amen. We're starting a new sermon series today. Uh, I'm, I'm borrowing the title of this series from a Christian classic called The Tale of, a Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards. And I'm going to be talking about the first three kings of Israel. And I want to take our opening text from the book of Proverbs, chapter 21. If you have your Bibles with you, amen. If you have a paper Bible, that's good. We can stand. If you have use a tablet, that's good as well. If you use a phone, that's fine. If not, you can just look at the screen. Um, Proverbs 21, verse 1 to 2. The Bible says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Uh, the king being the, the epitome of, of uh, position, of, of success, if you will. It says that his heart is in the hand of the Lord. Verse 2, it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Don't we know that to be true? We, we always think we're right, right? But this was a good uh, topic with a marriage seminar, you know, when husbands and wives have a little conflict. We always think we're right. They need to listen to me. But this says, but the Lord weighs the hearts. I'm going to be talking about, as we look into the hearts of these first three kings um, and how it also has implications for us. I want to talk to you about the, the rise and fall of King Saul. The rise and fall of King Saul. Amen. You, you can put your Bibles down, but I wonder if we could pray with me one more time and ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for ministering to us already in this service, speaking to us through the gifts of the Spirit and through this worship service, Lord, that we can sense your Spirit moving in our midst. Once again, we ask you for your anointing to be upon your people and upon your servant. Empower us, Lord. Speak to us, Lord God, even through frail human instrumentality, Lord, even through, uh, Lord God, broken vessels, I pray that you would have your way. We give you thanks and praise here today. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you clap your hands one more time and give him praise. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. A couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about uh, the story of Gideon, one of the judges of Israel. And in that period in the history of Israel, and uh, what was a very tumultuous period, and it concludes with the beginning of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel is where the prophet Samuel becomes, is the last judge, but he is also prophet. And, and God uses Samuel as a voice to the people of God. Now Samuel gets older in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Bible tells us that Samuel was old and he made his sons judges over Israel. Uh, but it says in verse 3, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. Uh, they, were, they grew up in a preacher's home, but as preachers themselves, they were dishonest. They took bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders came and gathered to Samuel in Ramah. And said to him, look, you're old and your sons are not walking in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. They wanted a king. The children of Israel wanted a king just like all the other neighboring nations uh, around them. And uh, this, this upset Samuel. This annoyed him because he was happy with the way things were. That he was a prophet and he wanted that office to be passed down to his sons, but his sons were not living right. And so Samuel uh, comes before the Lord, and the Lord says, you know, don't get upset with the people uh, just because they want a king, because Samuel's ideal was that God would be their king. That was the ideal situation, that God would be their king. They didn't need a physical king, but the people wanted it. They wanted somebody that they could see, somebody that they could touch, they could handle, and so God says to Samuel, don't get upset. They haven't rejected you, but they've rejected me. 
Uh, it's not you, Samuel. Don't take it personal. Uh, but it's, it's me that they're actually uh, not wanting as their king. They want somebody else. But he said, that's fine. Give them a king. And then he says in chapter 8 throughout that, and then he says, but if they're going to have a king, it's going to exact something from them. They're going to have to provide their sons and their daughters to serve the king. Their sons to be the drivers and to be the gardeners and the plumbers, whatever. Uh, the daughters, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. The, the daughters are going to have to be in the kitchen making food for the king. You're going to have to pay tribute to the king in order for the king to live like a king. And so he says, give them what they want, but, uh, uh, you know, it's going to cost them something. Uh, you got to be careful what you ask for. Amen. Because sometimes what we ask for, we don't realize it will cost us a little extra. It's going to cost us something. You know, we, we think that if we could just have a little bit more money and, and if, if, our, if our business can just get a little bit more expanded, but, but with more money comes more problems, right? Isn't that what they said? More money, more problems? M-O, not M-O-R-E, more money. <laughs> More, the bigger the business, the bigger the staff, the more you got to deal with, the more problems that in your, in your brain. We think that all the billionaires have it all made, but let me tell you, they're not always sleeping that well. Uh, the rich and famous are not always, you look at how many divorces they go through in Hollywood, all right? They're not the example for marriage. Uh, they, they, you know, I think the, the average marriage lasts for about three years in Hollywood. So that's not necessarily the ideal. But, but God in his kindness, in his grace says, okay, let them have a king. And so for the first time in Israel's history, they have a king. And in fact, God allows for it. He gives a uh, uh, contingency. He allows a uh, conditions for a king in Deuteronomy chapter 17. He tells them that the word of the Lord says, if you're going to have a king, this king in verse 16, he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. Uh, he shall not multiply wives to himself like the other kings, unless his heart is turned away. Uh, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be in verse 18 when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, when he shall write him a copy of the law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. It shall be with him, and he shall read all the days of his life. He said, you can have a king, but this king is going to be different from all other kings. He's not going to have a lot of horses. He's not going to have, he can't have a lot of money. He can't have a lot of wives and a lot of silver and gold. You can have a king, but this king, he's going to be writing the law. He's going to be copying the, the Bible. He's going to be reading it out aloud. It's not going to be like any other king. You can have it, but you got to have all of these conditions. Because when he rises to that position of power, when he is elevated to the ultimate position of authority, he's got to take care that his heart is does not become corrupted is not become does not become consumed with stuff and all of the opulence and the abundance of things but as a king he's got to make sure that he's reading the word of God that the word of God is in his heart and so that he can be the king of Israel represent the king of kings Amen. Can I tell you here today, there is a danger in, in us being elevated. There is a danger with our success and prosperity. And I, again, I'm not against prosperity. I'm not against God blessing his people. I believe that God blesses his people. But we can take a lesson from that passage in Deuteronomy that he tells the king, even with all of your abundance, you've got to make sure you don't have too many things that will corrupt your heart, that will lead your heart away from the worship of the one true God. Hallelujah. Can I tell you even, I suppose even at this stage in our lives, uh, perhaps uh, what God is not elevating us or God is not prospering us uh, or God is not leading us to the next level of our positions uh, because our hearts, because God knows uh, that our hearts, if he gives us those things, uh, our hearts can become corrupted away from the worship of the one true God. Can I get a witness, somebody here? 
Hallelujah. God knows, yes, oh, God, life would be so much better if you simply give me the, the Powerball numbers. But God knows if he gave you the numbers and you won $5 million, he knows you're not going to be in church next Sunday. He knows, amen, you're going to be drifted away, that your worship of the one true God now becomes your worship of that, that brand new boat and that brand new house and, and that, that holiday over in Europe and, and whatever it is. And again, I'm not against those things. But perhaps God is allowing us to be where we are today and not opening that door to the next stage because our spirits are not ready. Hallelujah. And you, if you want God to elevate you where you are right now, you ought to tell God, God, my heart is fixed upon you. My heart is going to stay with you. Whether I'm in the mountain or in the valley, my heart is going to be upon you. Thank you for the new car. Thank you for the job promotion. Thank you, God, that I got some new clothes. Thank you for your blessings. But my heart is not in those things. I'm fixing my heart to worship you. Oh, I wish I had some help in here today. Hallelujah. Maybe where you are right now is preparation for you to take you to the next level. I don't want to raise you up because I know if I do, you're going to walk away. Your hearts are going to be consumed with stuff. Oh, but today we have the opportunity to say, God, my heart is yours. Come hell or high water, whether I'm rich or I'm poor, whether I'm healthy or I'm sick, whether I got friends or I'm by my Myself, my heart is towards you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's why that, that Proverbs that we read in the opening text, it says the, hand, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. In other words, he knows what's in the heart. And, and, and you, you can tell a lot about a person's character when, when, when they're going through tribulation and when they're going through trial that tests the character of the individual. But can I tell you, another test of a person's character is not just when they're in the battle, it's when they have been given authority and power and they've been given stuff. That's how you know the character of a person is when they have some power. And that's what God tests. Can he trust you with some power? Can he trust you that you're going to be faithful when he gives you that extra stuff? Can he trust you that you're going to stay with him even though you've got everything that you need that your life is prospering and thank God for the blessings of God but can he trust us even when he gives us stuff and so I, I want to look at the rise and fall of King Saul uh, this king that was the first of, of Israel the first king of all of Israel uh, the Bible tells us that, that he had a he had a good good beginning he had a good start his rise was one of, of nobility and one that we can take note. The Bible tells us that he was handsome, that he was tall. He was also humble, chosen to be the first king where the throne would be promised to the house of Saul forever. He would have the lineage of the, the royal lineage in his household. But his life would end in this royal lineage being cut off shame for his own children he was life would would turn into bitterness being twisted and fearful where he would be consulting with witches being demonized i believe he was demonized he was oppressed by demons and ultimately he would fall upon his own sword in an ignominious death in a death that was shameful worse than that he would be rejected by god himself this was a sad story, but I want you to take note that he started well. He started off good, that he was humble before the Lord. And, and, and the Bible tells us that he was a, a Benjamite. And, and when he was going off and he came across Samuel, and Samuel gave him the word that he would be the next leader of, of Israel, he said, who am I? I'm just a Benjamite. I'm from the smallest tribe and the smallest family from the smallest tribe of Israel. And well, I'm a, we're nobody and who we are. There was a humility that was in Saul 
to begin with. And I think this kind of reminds us of the story we read of Gideon. Remember that a couple of weeks ago? We took looked at Gideon and how Gideon also said that he was a, of the smallest of families and was nothing. This was how Saul started. It started in humility, and God would call him. Uh, and one day the story goes that his father lost the donkeys, and the, these donkeys that went missing, so he went out with his servant to look for the donkeys. He looked for these missing animals for three days. Three days, folks. <laughs> he, this is persistence. <laughs> uh, I, I, if I lose my keys after three hours, I, I'm just about to tear my head out, you know, and, 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 and turn the whole house upside down. But three days he came looking, and in the process of the three days, he came across the prophet, the man of God, Samuel. And when Samuel came across him, he said, gave him the word of prophecy, and he anointed him as the next or the first king of Israel on that day. He took a flask and first Samuel chapter 10 and poured a flask of oil poured it on his head and kissed him and said is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance I want you to take note of that story brothers and sisters that it was while he was serving his father's need while he was fulfilling the need of his father looking for these donkeys that God intersected his position and anointed him to be the king of Israel Hallelujah. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, that's how it is with us. If you want God's anointing to be upon your life, if you want God's hand to be upon you and his destiny to be fulfilled in your life, it comes when we are serving God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's how Saul started. He started off as a servant. Amen. And let me tell you that that's where we've got to begin. If you want to see the hand of God upon your life, it begins with the heart and the spirit of servanthood that we are willing to simply serve God and fulfill what he has called us to do. And I promise you when you are serving the Lord that somehow the divine intervention is going to take place in your life to fulfill the will of God upon you. Hallelujah. You say, well, I don't have anything right now. Everybody can do something to serve God in his kingdom. Everybody can do, you can, you can pick up some rubbish on the floor. You can invite somebody to the house of God. You can open the door with a smile, not with a frown, with a smile. You can open the door for somebody with a smile. And in the process, as you are serving God, God will fulfill his calling and destiny over your life. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, don't seek your kingdom, don't seek your agenda, but seek first his kingdom. What does God want for my life? How can I live for him? How can I serve him? How can I align my life in righteousness? Oh, and he promises all of your needs will be added unto you. Hallelujah, you're hearing what I'm saying. Seek first his kingdom. Put him number one on your priority list. Please him with your life. And God will make sure every need that you have, he's going to meet that need. Oh, let's clap our hands to the Lord and praise him. Hallelujah. So Saul started off as a servant. He started off with a sense of humility that he was just from the smallest tribe, from the smallest family of the smallest tribe in all of Israel. There was this humility that was found in Saul as a first king. Yet he was, he was handsome. He was tall, head and shoulders above everybody. And then uh, that's, this is, this is when, when God calls him. And so here's what, here's what Samuel says to, to Saul in chapter 10 and verse number 3. He says, then you should go forward. After he anoints him, you should go forward from there and come to Terebinth, tree of Tabor. There three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. And after that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you come there, the city, that you will meet a group of prophets... Coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute. They were having a church service. 
and the harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then verse 6, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord, watch this, will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And when these things come to you, you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you, and you will be turned into another man. Folks, can I tell you that this is a foreshadowing of what will happen in the New Testament to the born-again believer that, that somehow, see, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon them. But when Jesus Christ begins the gospel of the kingdom, the Spirit of God doesn't just come upon a person, but he said it will be in you, Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord will flow through you. Oh, hallelujah. This is what happens when a person is, is a servant, when they are humble before God, and they, they hear the gospel of the message of how Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed his blood on the cross and died on the cross for the sins of humanity, that mankind, and a person hears that message, he repents of his sins and is baptized in Jesus' name to have his sins washed away, then the promise is you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that that's just, that's not an extra blessing. The Holy Spirit is not just some added benefit, but the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for you to go to heaven, that if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can't go to heaven. I don't know how much clearer I can make it. You need the Spirit of God in order for you to spend eternity with God, because if you have not the Holy Ghost, Paul says you are none of his. You don't belong to God. You are an order orphan and illegitimate but if you have the Holy Ghost you receive the spirit of adoption whereby you cry Abba Father Hallelujah, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, just as he turned into another man, when the Spirit of God came upon him, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Your dead spirit that was dead in sin becomes regenerated. It comes alive. It is born again. And you receive the Holy Ghost, and you become a brand new creature. That's why Jesus said, wait for the promise from on high. For when you receive this power, you shall be witnesses unto me. Something's going to change in you. Something's going to transform. This fearful disciples that ran and hid when Jesus was arrested on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came down and filled them with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak and tongues. They were empowered. They were changed. They were turned into a new man, into a new person. God will transform your life by the power Oh, hallelujah. I'm excited about that because he didn't just give us some religion and, and some forms and some, some, some services. He gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit to dwell on the inside of us that we can become a new creature. Hallelujah, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, that's why you become a new person. I love what Brother Stonekey says. He turns the introverts into extroverts. He turns the extroverts into introverts. Something happens when you get the Holy Ghost. That shy, quiet, timid person, they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, begin to speak in tongues. Something changes. They go to the workplace and begin to share about Jesus Christ. They go and ring up all their family and say, you got to come to church. What happened to you. You were the quiet little miss and mister. Now there's something different about you. It's the Holy Ghost and power. It's the Spirit of God. Jesus said, I will be in you as a river. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
Folks, we're not trying to sell you religion here. We're trying to tell you that it's already been poured out. It's a free gift. We're not selling anything. We're trying to get folks to heaven. It's a free gift that God has already poured out. He started it 2,000 years ago. And can I tell you, you can have the same promise of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. You become a new man. You become a whole new person. Thank you, brother. Boy, it was freezing this morning. It's hot in here now. He turns. See, I was, I, I always feel like I'm a natural introvert. I, I like my alone time. I like quiet time. I'm a quiet person, really, by nature. I guess part of that is the way that I was brought up. You know, you got to understand the personality is malleable. It changes. It can change. And, and you know, it, before I came to Christ, it, it took a little bit of alcohol to get me out of my shell. How many of you like that with me? I'm naturally an introvert. But when I came to the Lord, God gave me his spirit. He says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And God called me to be a minister. And I said, I, I can't share the gospel to folks if I'm so introverted and I'm afraid. But God, you gave me the whole, you said you should receive power after that the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. After that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. If he gives me the Holy Ghost, it's so that I can be a witness to the world, to share to the world about who Jesus is. Can I tell you, we can come out of our shell through the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. His spirit emboldens us. It gives us the courage. And Jesus even said, you know what? You don't even have to rehearse what you say. He said, I'm going to give you the words when you stand before magistrates, when you stand before folks, and you open up your mouth, God will supernaturally, he'll start giving you the words to speak, to share the goodness of God. Can I tell you, if that can happen to Saul, that he was turned into another man, the Spirit of God can transform your life. That's why Jesus said you got to be born again. Amen. It's like you can start all over again your life. I, I, wish I, I wish I could actually be physically born again. So I said, God, can you make me six foot at least? That would have been good. But no, you are in the eyes of God. You are a whole new creature. Your identity is changed. That's why you've got to understand when you come to God, you start to change the way that you think. You let the Bible, the word of God, begin to influence how you see yourself. That when you are born again and you are washed in baptism, the old man is buried. The old nature of who you were before is now buried in water in the name of Jesus. Jesus, never to be remembered again. And that's why Paul says in Romans, when you come up out of the water, you walk in the newness. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for freshness and newness. You walk in the newness of life. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. You walk in a new life. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by the mistakes of yesterday. You're not defined by the words of your father and your mother and your caregivers that were negative, that told you you'll never make it, that told you you're a loser, that told you you have got no future. No, you can, you can reject those in Jesus' name and come to an understanding when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you and in you you become a whole new creature <laughs> hallelujah that's that's how you you've got to start to change your identity and how you see yourself you've got to start seeing yourself as a child of God as as a daughter of the king that's why we're looking at kings the bible says we are kings and and priests so I'm not, not that doesn't mean you go around and say I'm a king of Australia you're a king in your own home. In the spiritual, we have authority in the spiritual realm. We are kings and priests. And so we have this identity. You've got to start to change the way you see yourself. It, 
the reason why people don't make it in living for God is because, yes, they love God. Yes, they want to come to church. They get a touch from God. They love the worship, and they even get baptized, but they don't change the way that they see themselves. They don't change their idea. You've got to become a whole new person that I'm not that old person anymore. I am a Christian. I am a believer. I am a son, daughter of God. Hallelujah. Amen. You got to, you know, I have to say, it's like, you know, it's like anybody ever own a white suit? I've had a beige suit. Never had the courage to buy white shoes in a white suit. But I know a pastor who wears a white suit and they say, man, bro, that looks amazing. It suits you. But if you had a white suit on, you're not going to be, you're not going to be going to the park and play tackle football. Because, you know, if it's a Hugo Boss suit, oh, my Lord, $7,000. Stick to Lowe's. If you had a white Hugo Boss suit on, you're not going to go and, and, and roll in the mud. <laughs> Amen. Because, you know, no, I, I, I got to keep this white and pristine. I'm not going to let it, I'm not going to get it dirty. It's the same when you get the Holy Ghost. When you come to know the Lord, you're not just you're not going to roll back into sin. When you come to recognize, hey, hang on a minute, my sins are white. My, I'm, I'm wearing a white garment of holiness, of righteousness, of purity. I, I'm not going to go rolling in the in the in the dens and in the havens of sin. I'm not going to get myself muddy. I'm going to continue to walk because I am a child of God. Yeah. Hallelujah, glory to God. And so here he is. Saul was empowered by the Spirit of God. He prophesied. He was turned to another man. People were just, who is this guy? Who is this man? The Spirit empowered him. And, and then watch verse number, chapter 10 of 1 Samuel, verse 15. And, and Saul's uncle, he would have evidently heard that, that Saul had come across the great prophet Samuel. And he said to him, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you? So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, it says, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. He kept it to himself. This was the spirit of Saul. This is how he started. He kept it to himself. Some of us, we would have posted it on Facebook. We would have let social media world know, Samuel laid his hand on me. I'm going to be the next king of you guys. I'm, I'm going to be your boss. Sorry, guys. No, he, he didn't say that. He kept it to himself. There was a sense of humility. Say, Listen, the, Jesus said, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Some people say, well, here I am. I'm about to give to the work of God. Here's my $100. No, you see, when we do good, we don't have to tell anybody. Because God who sees in secret, the Bible says, will reward you openly. Amen. Whenever you do something for the Lord, you don't have to tell, advertise anyone to anybody. You don't have to, you don't have to tell people who you are to validate your, your, your value, your, your identity. Amen. You let others do that for you. Oh, you, know, you don't have to blow your own trumpet. Other people can blow your trumpet for you. Amen. So, so here's my trumpet. Can you blow it? <laughs> But he kept it to himself. Saul started off so well. He was humble. He was small in his own sight. He, 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 he wasn't boastful. He kept it to himself. He doesn't say a word. And, and he, he prophesies. And then ultimately he has an opportunity to fight the enemy. And, and, and he's victorious against the Philistines. He calls all the people, and, and, and he gathers an army to, to defeat the enemy, and he's victorious in the sight of people. But, but here, here's where I am perplexed about the story of Saul. This, I've been reading 1 Samuel the last few weeks, and so I, I think we can learn from the story of the kings because the king is, is the highest position that one could ever attain in the land of Israel. And, and our ultimate test is a test of heart, of not just when you're in trouble, 
but when you've, when you've reached the top, as it were. And, and Saul, eventually, he, he would, there's, no, there's nothing in Scripture to point to, the, to where it all changed for him. Perhaps it was when he was in the palace now. He was the king and he was getting served. And, and he was, you know, people were waiting on him hand and foot, serving the king and, and giving everything that he needed. Perhaps it was the comforts of the position that he was in that caused his heart to somehow drift away from God. It does, there's not one point. He would eventually die. The Bible says he would be shot by an arrow. And from that wound, he would take his own sword and kill himself. And he would, he would kill, he would commit suicide. It was not an honorable death. It was not like the Japanese samurai seppuku or harakiri, whatever you say. It was a dishonorable death. But I submit to you that Saul's demise happened long before that day when he took his own life. It was a it was a seri- it was it was an, a gradual drifting away of his heart away from God. And the little things that, that he allowed to creep into his heart. You see, one of the things that, that God could have everything in this world. He spoke the world into existence, but there's one thing that he doesn't have. And he says that in his word, son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. He can have everything in this world, but one thing he cannot take possession of unless we give it to him willingly is this, is our hearts. So Saul walked away, drifted slowly, gradually, Eventually killing his own self, rejected by God, drifting away from the Lord. What started out so good ended in, in such dismay and, and, and tragedy, misery. His sons would not inherit the throne. Jonathan would be killed on the battlefield, his son, David's best friend. All because this man who had it all allowed his heart to slowly drift and be corrupted away. The first instance we read is when he came across the Philistines again for battle. And, and the, what they would normally do, they would make a sacrifice to the Lord, and then they would fight the battle. Because once they made the sacrifice, then God could bless them. Sacrifice meant repentance. And so Saul did something that, that he, wasn't, he didn't have the authority to do. He decided to undertake the sacrifice himself which was reserved only for priests and prophets because Samuel was just taking a little too long and, and he couldn't wait for Samuel to come. So he took it upon himself to undertake and officiate the sacrifice. Something that was a sin wasn't allowed for, for him. It was only allowed for priests. And when Samuel came, he was only late. I don't know, he came that same day. Samuel was there at the same day and he came. He says, and he said to Saul, what have you done? And, and, and here's, here's what's perplexing about the story, is that he did something that he wasn't allowed to do, but David did the same thing. David ate of the shoe bread that was only allowed for the priests. He took the bread, and yet God forgave David, but yet God rejected Saul. They were both, they both committed what we would call ceremonial sins against the Lord. One was forgiven, and yet one was, was rejected. In fact, if you look at the story of David, what David did was so much worse than Saul's. David committed adultery. There's no record of Saul committing adultery. David killed a man. He killed Uriah, the husband of the woman he committed adultery with, essentially committed murder. Saul didn't say he committed any murder. Yet God forgave David, but he rejected Saul. Why? Because there's something in the heart of a human being that only God sees, that only God knows. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He is an, ex- an Old Testament example of what we call a reprobate mind in the New Testament. A reprobate mind is a mind that is so corrupted that it cannot think godly, that it has been totally rejected by God. That's why he was rejected, because he did not allow God into his heart, into his mind. He became so corrupted with what was going on around him that he fell out from God. But here was David. Even though he committed sin, when God confronted him with the 
word. He said, you are the man. He fell to his face in repentance and cried out to God, and God was forgiven. I don't know what it is, folks. Brothers and sisters, I'm preaching about the human heart. I'm preaching about something that only you and I have ownership of with inside of us. I pray, God, don't ever let me have a reprobate mind. Don't let me have a mind that is so arrogant and filled with pride that I can't hear your voice any longer, that it is drawn away from you. Oh, but let me have a heart. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter how deep in sin you have been. If there is inside of you a heart that says, God, I believe you. God, I surrender myself to you. I submit my life into your hands. I promise you forgiveness will flow. His mercies, the Bible says, are from everlasting to everlasting. They are new every morning. Amen. If your heart is willing Hallelujah. Nobody can will to you a hungry heart. No, not even God himself can will to you a desire for him. It's something that you've got to sort out within yourself. It's something that you've got to stir within yourself. God cannot make you follow him. But if you are hearing the sound of my voice today, hearing the word of the Lord, and you can take this heart and say, God, here it is. God, I surrender. Do what you will with me. Create in me a clean heart heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Neither take thou your Holy Spirit from me, but uphold me with your free spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll talk about the fall of Saul in a couple of weeks. The rise of Saul was good. But remember, it's not how you start in this thing that matters. It's how you finish. You will not get rewarded even if you had an 80% of your life is good, but the final 20%, there's no reward. Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Hallelujah. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. But you've got, you've got to give your heart to God. You've got to surrender your heart to the Lord. Maybe a reprobate mind is like a, it's called myocardioplasty. It's when the fibers of the heart become stiffened. It becomes hardened and usually leads to a cardiac arrest. It's possible for the vital organ of the heart itself to become stiffened. That it doesn't allow any blood to flow. It's possible even as we get older, we become stubborn in our ways. We become hard-hearted. We become impatient with God. But let me tell you, sometimes time is God's tool to develop something in us. Yes, we can handle persecution. We can handle tribulation. We can handle sometimes unanswered questions. But sometimes it's the waiting, like that song that we sang, waiting on the Lord. It's sometimes the waiting that is the most difficult and challenging. Can you say still? That's a test of your maturity. I mean, babies aren't going to wait for you. When, when babies want to get changed, they're nappy. They're not going to say, oh, well, I better let mom and dad sleep through the night, and I'll let them have eight hours, and then they can change me. When baby's hungry... They don't say, well, I'll let mommy just, you know, uh, uh, just have her meal first, and then I'll, I'll just quietly wait. No, when, when they, babies don't have patience. When they're wet now, they're wet right now. <laughs> when they need to, when they're hungry now, they're hungry right now. But when the child gets a little older, mom and dad says, no, you got to learn to wait. Son. Wait before for your meal. No snacks before your meal. And that's the same with us. When God wants to develop maturity in us, can learn to wait. Say, God, I, I don't have to have my problem solved quickly. I don't, I don't have to have that job straight away. I don't have to have this, that, or the other straight away. I can learn to wait upon you. For they that wait upon the Lord, oh, what does it say? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall, what, run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. When you can learn to wait on the Lord. 
Be patient. Be humble. Be trusting in God. Musicians, you could come. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is here today. The Spirit of the Lord moves upon a heart that is hungry and thirsty. That's what Jesus said in that day. He says, if any man is thirsty, often we forget that part and just focus on out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. I think the operable word is thirsty. Because if you're not thirsty, you're not going to take a drink. If you're not hungry, you're not going to want to eat. But he said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me, he says, and drink. And out of his belly, when you take a drink, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. This spake he, not of literal water, but of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he likens the Holy Ghost to water, to drinking. That if you are thirsty in your spirit, God can fill you if you take a drink. If you believe, you can take a drink. I was in Canberra a few weeks ago. There was a lady there. She was Persian. And uh, uh, from, from Iran. And, and, and she, she didn't know about this God. But, but, she, but she was telling me after service, she said, God filled her with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues because the lady who is, she's actually the, her friend who brought her, she's Croatian, started praying for her in tongues. And when she was praying for her in tongues, she said she started speaking in her native Farsi, native Persian. She said that absolutely blew me away. And, and what the message in Farsi was in clear Farsi, she says, look unto me, look unto me. And when she did that, God filled her with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. The Spirit of God is being poured out all over this world. He already promised in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. It says your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. I'm telling you, sometimes when we don't know what to pray for. Sometimes when you don't have words for what you're going through, pray in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, the Spirit of God makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, where you can't put even words. When you don't know what to pray, pray in the Holy Ghost. When you don't know what to say, pray in the Spirit of God, and God will pray through you. Your spirit is being built up. Your mind is unfruitful. Oh, but your spirit is growing. And I'm telling you here today, the Spirit of God is here. If we can be like this king to begin with humility, with patience, with trusting, with a sense of servanthood, Jesus said, by your patience, possess your souls. Today we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and have our souls saved and have your names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We had two young ladies in the first service baptized in Jesus' name. Praise the name of the Lord. If you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, you can be baptized today. Have your sins washed away and be born again of water and the Spirit. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Hallelujah. Saul had it all. King Saul began well. His rise was one that was honorable. But somehow he drifted away. His heart became impatient, proud, rebellious, arrogant. He started to consult with witches. He was oppressed by demons in his room. The first king of Israel. All because in his heart there was a drift, there was a corruption that took place. Today I want to encourage somebody right now, as you lift your hands and your voices in prayer, we make this place an altar, a giant altar in this house where we can lay our hearts before God and let the Spirit of the Lord transform us again afresh and anew. If you've never received this wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, you can receive this gift. This is for whosoever will. Would you lift your voices in prayer in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. Thank you for what we feel in this house. Lord, we thank you that you have been merciful and gracious. Lord, you are our king.
You are the King of kings. And today, Lord Jesus, we surrender the throne of our hearts to you, for you to sit, and for you to, to reign sovereign over our lives, surrendering our hearts to you, Lord Jesus, today. That, God, you would fill us and empower us again, that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon us and flow through us to transform us, that we become another man, that we become another woman, a renewed heart. Today, Lord Jesus, we believe your word and your promises. We surrender our hearts and, and yield it to be malleable and soft into your hands. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I wonder if we could come as a church to this altar. If you want to receive a touch from God, find a place where you can surrender your heart before the Lord. I want to invite you to come. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, you will... Your, your gift is here waiting for you to take it up. It's a promise from the Lord. If you need a touch from God and healing in your body, the healer is here today. You can find a place where you are to pray and to seek his face. If you've never spoken in tongues and received this wonderful gift, I want to urge you, don't delay. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait because tomorrow may never come. Someday may never arrive. But today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Right now is your time. Now is the time for God to, to do a work in your life. Will you not give your heart to Him? Will you not submit your heart to the Lord? Is your heart in the hand of the Lord? Does He direct you? We might be right in our own ways, but the Lord knows the way that we take. Seek him today while he may be found. Whatever your need is in this house, let God meet it for you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.
Jesus.